Welcome to Vibe, uh, Vibe Coworks. Welcome to Zero Proof. Um, for those of you that I haven't met yet, my name is Elena Imbach, um, and I'm one of the founders here at Vibe Coworks. We're really, really excited to be here tonight for, for a number of reasons. Um, one, because of the topic and the conversation that I think we're going to have here tonight. And two, very much because this is the first event of this kind that we've done here at Vibe. Um, for those of you who don't know who we are as Vibe Coworks, we moved into this building about three months and a bit ago. Um, we'd been, the last year, we've been just across the parking lot um, in a small space that we kind of used as our experimental lab before we moved here. Um, and we're a shared workspace and co-working community. Um, so we've got you know, all kinds of great places to come and work and hold meetings and um, build professional relationships. But we're also very excited to have this space available to hold events like this. Um, that really drive dialogue and conversation um, around the work that people here in our community are doing. Um, the other thing that I'm excited about tonight, I actually wear multiple hats. Um, so in addition to the work that I do here at Vibe Coworks, I work for an organization called WaterAid. And we do uh, clean water and toilets in developing countries. So we're in 37 countries globally. Um, which is a cause that I'm very passionate about and it really made a, a cool match for tonight's conversation as we're talking about drinks and access to water and a lot of people um, in the countries are work working, not in the field countries, but in a lot of the off main office countries are, are celebrating dry January this month. Um, so they're giving up alcohol and putting the money that they normally put into their alcoholic drinks into donations to water aid. So, um, no obligation, but of course tonight we made the tickets free. We'd love if you might consider giving a donation to WaterAid in lieu of your ticket. Um, there's a table with more information. I'm happy to share a bit about it, um, but thank you for coming. So um, with me here tonight, we really have five very diverse leaders in their own right, um, each of whom comes from a really different direction and perspective on this topic, which is what I'm most excited about because I think most often when we get talking about any given subject, we really kind of stick to the singular perspective. Um, and I think we've tried to put together a panel that um, comes from a lot of different angles and views and experiences. And um, the one thing that I really want to emphasize as well is that we're not here today to talk about alcoholism or addiction or even encouraging or suggesting that people need to drink less. Um, it's a no judgment zone. We don't really care what your drinking choices are. It's really a conversation about options and diversity and inclusion in um, our consumer choices. So um, I pulled this quote. One of the biggest trends in cocktails last year was zero proof. And um, as one beverage executive said recently, it took all of us by storm. Some of the folks up here. Some of the folks that are up here tonight are driving that storm, and that's what we really want to dive into. Um, so represented here, we've got folks that really come from the wellness angle, the inclusivity and hospitality angle, market demand, and ultimately what we're talking about is freedom of choice without judgment. Um, I pulled a few facts that kind of, I think, situate where this conversation is right now. So we've got more than 5 million people around the world this month who are, quote, atoning for their excess holiday drinking with dry January, <laughs> um, which for some is a month-long experiment in sobriety. And we have drinkers across the country who will be celebrating National Mocktail Week next week for the very first time, thanks to Marnie here. So we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, I also find it interesting that statistics show the overall global consumption of alcohol is declining um, which has been widely attributed to things like shifting demographics, health and wellness trends, and fewer drink-led occasions. Um, so right now, for this year, if I've got my stats right, they're predicting the non-alcoholic beverage market to be worth over $200 billion this year. So without further ado, um, I'd love for each of you up here to take a quick minute to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you're... Testing, testing, we're good. Um, how your work intersects with the booze-free drinking boom that we're here to dive into today. So, Marnie, let's start with you. Is that better? Yeah. I'm Marnie Clark. 
Um, I'm a local business owner here in the community with my husband. Uh, you can find me online as Marnie Ray, just a little more exciting than Marnie Clark. <laughs> um, and online, we talk a lot about mocktails, alcohol-free drinks, the importance of them, not necessarily all about the drink as it is maybe about inclusion and community. Um, that's where you'll find recipes, you'll find places to go that offer non-alcoholic beverages. Um, we're starting this alcohol-free movement here locally and globally, as I'll talk about in a little bit later. It's been a pretty eventful day here at Marnie Ray uh, that I'll share with you in a bit. Um, hi, I'm Madeline Pratt. I, I also can be found under another name online. I, Madeline Reeves, my maiden name. Um, my background is in the world of technology, and so kind of the perspective I'm bringing to the table today is some of my experiences working at different companies and how their culture shifted around changes in um, opinions around alcohol. Um, my personal work now is uh, with my own consulting company. I work with female founders, progressive accounting firms, and technology companies that are looking to change their branding, marketing, and overall culture. My name is Dan Hollingsworth, and um, along with my wife, uh, we own Kitsap CrossFit, which is a CrossFit affiliate or a strength and conditioning facility here in Paulsbo. Uh, and so I come at this from kind of the health, fitness, and wellness angle. Um, and <clears throat> obviously we have a lot of people that are uh, talking to us about how they can improve uh, their health and fitness. And uh, while we don't necessarily tell them that they have to quit drinking, what we want to do is help them develop uh, lifestyle habits that will help support their goals and the work that they're doing um, in the gym. So without undoing that. Great. Uh, my name is Peter Crabtree, and I'm the founder and CEO of Crabtree Brands, which encompasses Crabtree Kitchen and Bar. That's the other uh, top floor tenant in this building, um, which will be our new restaurant that we're opening up here shortly. Um, Chocmo, that's down on the main floor, and High Spirits, which is our, uh, our Paul's Bow liquor store. Uh, with over 10,000 square feet of uh, beer, wine, spirits, and, and all of that fun stuff. So, um, you know, I'm really coming at this from the hospitality angle. Um, you know, uh, from the time we started designing Crabtree Kitchen and Bar, uh, we had decided that I really wanted to have um, a strong non-alcoholic uh, drink program um, as a, a key component of, of what was going to make us unique and interesting. Um, and I have a, a number of reasons for why that's important to me and, and uh, why that matters, and, and uh, we'll get into more of that. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Hi there. Uh, my name is Dan McDougall. I own Malolo Design. We are located in Kingston. We are a small design agency that specializes in craft beer and beverage. Uh, we've been in business for about five years now, and uh, the beer industry has been really good to us. So I'm coming at it from a, a completely different angle, but I'll share what I can. Thank you. I'm going to pass the mic back to Marnie. I'm going to put Marnie on the spot. So Marnie, um, I will say, was really kind of the, uh, I'm blanking on the word, impetus for tonight. Um, so I, Marnie is a founding 40 member here at Vibe. Um, and I've just loved her story of kind of how she's building this movement, this, the momentum that she's gaining. Um, it's, more than, it's more than a business. It really is a, a, moment, a movement. Um, and I've been so excited because this month in particular with founding National Mocktail Week, she's got an event coming up that I hope she'll tell us about that kicks off next week in Seattle. And so I said, hey, Marnie, like the timing is perfect. We've really got to do something about this, and that's why we're here. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your story in depth, what brought you here today, and kind of what your path and journey has been, and what the, the vision is for, for this year and down the road. Thank you for having me, Elena. Elena contacted me at the beginning of December and asked if we could do this. And I was like, sure, sounds like a great idea. But if you've ever tried to get anybody to do anything during the holidays, you know how hard that is. So I am so appreciative that I honestly can't believe she pulled this all together during that time and you got, we got a full house here. So I'm very grateful for you and your team. Thanks to um, Peter and Carrie Crabtree also for making the drinks out in the lobby. I hope you had a chance to sample them all. And um, Peter, I actually sat down with and had coffee with one day last summer when he was starting construction on the restaurant. And he approached me about having a strong non-alcoholic drink program. And that was my question to him was why do you want this? And he said, because it builds community and what we are all about here at the Centennial Building and um, Crabtree Brands is building community, which I just kind of touched my heart a little bit. So thank you, Crabtrees, for that. 
Um, I introduced myself a little bit, but just to, so you know me a little more. We own a construction company here locally. We've been in business for 28 years, and we've lived in the North Kitsap area for 21 years. I have, we have a 25-year-old daughter and a 21-year-old daughter that have graduated from Kingston High School, and we currently have a seventh grade son, 13, <laughs> at Kingston Middle School. And those four people are really my whole heart. Um, I am online at MarnieRay.com, Facebook, Instagram, all those places. I hope you will check those sites out. We offer a lot of mocktail drink recipes there. And just we talk a little bit about lifestyle. And some of it is sober lifestyle because that's my story. And as Elena said, we're not here to talk about alcoholism or sobriety or any of those things. But that is part of my story. So I am going to share a little bit of that with you because it is the impetus that got me here today. So um, I got sober 16 years ago, which was a lifetime ago. but. Um, in that 16 years, it has been really hard to go out and, ha and have fun things to drink. It's a total um, first world problem, I know. <laughs> but it, it's, a ch it's a challenge. And when you are new to sobriety, it's very awkward and it's very uncomfortable, especially if you've been known as a drinker and now all of a sudden you're not drinking. There's always, you know, why aren't you drinking? Those types of things. So um, it was always kind of my hope that I could go somewhere and at least have something that kind of looked like a cocktail, which Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. Um, so I've kind of just resigned myself to the fact that water was going to be my drink of choice, um, which is actually fitting that we are here to support water aid tonight because I would love it if everybody had access to clean and safe water. Um, but every now and then, my husband and I will go out and I think, okay, tonight, you know, tonight, tonight, I'm going to try it again, and you know, nothing on the menu and really nothing appealing, and just kind of disappointed, which. Let's be honest here, it's not a deal breaker. If I get a bad drink or bad service, I'm not gonna you know, go home and talk about it on Facebook or you know, we're done for the night. It's just, it's a disappointment, but you move on. It's still a great, great evening. Um, anyhow, about three years ago, my husband and I went down to Portland for a weekend away. We're at a really great restaurant, really great hotel, and I just knew it was a farm to table restaurant. I just knew that this was gonna be the place I was gonna get the, the drink. And it was just a total, you know, <laughs> it was just all around bad. And I won't go into all the details, but I, I declared that night, I looked at my husband and I'm like, I don't get it. This has been, what, 13 years at that point, And nothing has changed in 13 years. I don't, I don't understand. So I'm going to fix this, but I don't know how I'm going to fix it, but I'm going to try. So I um, went home and I built a website and my goal was that I was just going to curate all the best mocktails that I could find on the internet and I was going to share them all with you guys in hopes that you would talk about it and that you would make them and that maybe bars and restaurants would get the clue that this is kind of important. But the problem three years ago is that if you googled mocktail, you would get something that was red and syrupy and slushy and it was usually listed under a blog title of like, special drinks to serve the kids at Christmas dinner which was not what I was looking for. You know, after years of ordering vodka martinis and black Russians, I didn't want red syrupy sweet drinks. So um, then I didn't know what to do. So I ended up hiring a recipe developer. I know what I like. I don't know how to get there. I don't know. I'm not good in the kitchen, really. So I just needed some help in trying to figure out what these recipes needed to be. So I hired the help of a recipe developer to come up with some recipes. And we've been doing that. They're posted on the website. They're great. We share them all the time. We have one here that we gave to Elena for her launch party. Uh, but what happened is I realized as we were creating all of these that it wasn't really about the drinks and it wasn't really about the recipes. It was really a bigger picture of it being about an experience. And again, first world problems. You know, you want to go out to dinner and you don't have anything to drink. But talking about this from a business and consumer level, I feel like there's a gap. The hospitality industry is missing the point here. There's a huge gap that um, there's potential for them to build community, to build customer loyalty, to bring in revenue. If I go to a restaurant and you have nothing on the menu, I'm probably going to order water. If you at least put something on the menu that looks appealing, I'm going to order that, whether it's three bucks or six bucks. But anyhow, so I realized that this was kind of becoming something more of a bigger picture. And then what happened? <laughs> is this kind of started to grow. And then I realized that I was starting to get messages from people saying, thank you so much. I don't drink because there's addiction in my family and I just don't even want to head down that path. 
or I don't drink because I have to leave this event tonight and go home and take care of my kids and I don't want to smell like booze and I want to be present. Or I don't drink because I have to run a half marathon in the morning. There was just a multitude of reasons that I didn't even really, I guess I never really thought about because. Oh, is it on timer? So my story is sobriety, and obviously people who don't drink alcohol, most of the time you assume that they're sober, and that's kind of what my assumption was, is that's who this community was going to be. So when all of these people started coming out of the woodwork telling me all these other reasons why they didn't drink, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much bigger than I had imagined. And so we have just continued to keep talking about it. We, um, we're trying to come up with a, uh, a content plan for blogs and my friend said, hey, you know, there's that national day calendar, which I don't, if, you, if any of you are in the content production industry, blog posts, any of that kind of stuff, you know what it is. It's the national day calendar. And these are, these are the people. I don't know who they are. <laughs> they have created this calendar that gives you like national taco day and national donut day and all these things. So we applied to them. And we're like, we should apply for national mocktail day. And then we're like, no, we need to apply for national mocktail week. So we did, and we got it, and it's not free. <laughs> so those people are up there counting their money, but <laughs> it was a worthwhile investment into an opp another opportunity for me to spread the message. So next week is the first official ever National Mocktail Week. In honor of that, we are hosting a launch party in Seattle at the Factory Lux, which is the old Rainier Brewery. Um, Many proceeds from the event will go towards the Recovery Cafe in Seattle. So we are partnering with my friend Chris Marshall from Sands Bar down in Austin, Texas. It's an alcohol-free pop-up bar. He's starting a 16-state national tour, and his very first stop is Seattle. We we're so proud to have him there, and I'm hoping Macklemore is coming. We are trying so hard. I know he's busy right now, you know, but ugh. anyhow, if you all know him, if you're a cousin, let me know. We'd really love for him to be there. Uh, but what's happened is we've discovered that this is something people want to talk about. So when I was telling you that some big things are happening, yesterday I did a TV shoot with Evening Magazine. That'll air on Tuesday night if you guys want to watch. And don't give me your feedback unless it's good. Because <laughs> I'm really nervous. Uh, I did an interview today with Forbes magazine and Fortune magazine. Um, rumor has it I will be on another local TV show next week. And I just got a phone call on the way in here from the Betty Ford Center that they've offered me a $1,000 sponsorship for my event next week. Now, I'm not telling you this because I'm braggy. I am the least braggy person you will ever meet. I am telling you this because this is something that is resonating with people. There is a movement afoot and we are a part of it. Just having this conversation right here is so important. I'm um, so honored to be here and be able to talk with you guys about it. And there's so many of you here, I wanna know why you're here. Obviously this has intrigued you in some way, shape or form. So uh, I don't know for sure, but I think I'm the only sober person up here. So this is actually really great for me too. I'm excited to get a perspective from the other four panelists. Um, I just encourage you to keep an open mind. As Elena said, this is not you drink, I don't drink. This is not either or or versus. This is we just all get to go out and have a good time together whether we drink or don't. So um, anyhow, I hope you learned something and I hope you have a good time and I really appreciate you all showing up. Thank you. Um, we're going to kind of circle back to everybody. We're going to kind of go down the line here. But um, So Madeline, when we were talking, so we've talked and thought a lot about um, kind of alcohol culture in the workplace, um, which I think is something that hits a lot of people. I think it hits women a, in a particular way um, that are trying to juggle family and career and all these things. Um, I think about it often in the context of co-working spaces also. It's a topic that comes up a lot. There's a number of co-working spaces that have beer on tap that's available all the time. Is that good? Is that bad? How does that change the culture? So. Um, that's kind of where we were coming at it when Madeline and I got talking, and we were talking about you know, how so much business has historically been done over cocktails. Um, and I think that's particularly so in a number of professional sectors. So in tech, in finance, um, law, um, startup world, those are kind of the first ones that come to my mind. Um, and, so, and it's also something that Madeline's talked about pretty extensively in her podcast called Fearless in Training. So, um, 
I guess from you, Madeline, how do you think workplace drinking culture has changed in the past five years? Or what are some of the things that you've seen generally? Um, so it's interesting because you, you, my most recent career kind of path has been touching a lot of those different sectors. So I was working in technology facing financial professionals at a startup. And so navigating kind of all those, those different things and, and seeing um, how, you know, the kind of Silicon Valley grows versus, um, you know, financial professionals face, you know, in a particular world that comes to alcohol. And um, I'm an anthropologist by schooling, and so I always think that when I go into these situations, I've got kind of my anthropology hat on, and I'm being observant. And um, I'm also a yogi, and so to me, um, I'm always trying to be super focused on um, why I'm doing anything that I'm doing. And, um, so I, as part of my work, I have to go to conferences. And um, conferences are kind of like summer camps. We're going to have to be in a really weird way. I think I'm off again. There we go. Um, and and it is a really eye-opening moment to watch the way that people um, behave differently, um, particularly when alcohol comes into play. And so um, I have to do this conference circuit every year. It starts in May and it goes all the way through November. And I'm at at least two, three, four, sometimes five conferences a month. And each one of them kicks off with a happy hour. And um, you know, these conferences are four to five day events sometimes. And so if you're kicking off with a happy hour, it's going to be like a hard decline um, to the ending day. And, and some of these people go really, really, really hard. And um, to me, that was a moment to step back and say, like, why are people engaging in this way? You know, I started pretty early on opting out of those events or doing um, what I call like the high buy situation where I would show up and like get my like gin and tonic, but really it's like tonic and lime, and then like doing a lap and leaving because people would invariably be just kind of like deteriorating in quality <laughs> as the night went on. And, and so, you know, what was like a conversation that was like this good, got like this good, and it just kind of kept going down in nature. And, um, you know, it, at first it was kind of, you know, fun and, and humorous to watch as, as, you know, people kind of came out of their shell. But, but then, you know, conference after conference, I would run into these situations where I was really just kind of concerned for people. Um, and one of the, the kind of personas or, or kind of industries that I work with a lot is accounting professionals. And accounting professionals, um, by nature, are typically super introverted people. Um, one time at, at an event we held, um, we did this situation where, where folks got an iPad. And on the iPad, some of our developers had come up with this really smart personality test. And when you took the personality test, you would get actually served up a cocktail or a mocktail that was designed based off of your personality trait. But the event was for accountants, and everybody ended up with the same drink because they all have the same personality. <laughs> and so, so our developers and the bartenders were pretty upset because they'd like gone to all this extra effort to create all these other personas, and it was like a whole thing. But it got me thinking about why you know, those individuals in particular feel the need to consume alcohol maybe at a higher rate than other people because they're feeling like it's a tool to get them out of their shells. And so um, for me, you know, being in that world and in that space, it's just something I've always had to kind of balance. I'm not anti-drinking. My husband, his background is in the hospitality industry. He loves bourbon. My family's Southern. Like, but, but it's always been this thing of why am I doing it or why am I not? And I think one of the, the things that I've always noticed is that particularly for women in these settings, there's a little bit of an extra nudge to loosen up and have a good time. And I don't really like to be told to do anything. <laughs> and so my response is typically not to. And so that's just kind of the angle I'm bringing to the table. These mics are definitely on timer. Just hitting the red button if it times out on you. Um, so Dan, um, we're interested in your perspective from kind of the wellness and nutrition and, and sports angle. I remember the first time that Marnie and I, I don't know if it was the first time we met, certainly the one of the first times that we sat down together, we were downtown Polsbo at a restaurant. Um, and one of the things that kept coming up was, was sports and its relationship with drink choices and how many of, I'm a runner, 
Uh, Marnie's a runner. How many of our friends have been training for races and it's the night before a race and you're out with friends and wanting to drink and you maybe want something other than water but you don't want beer and like what choices are out there. So um, I'm curious, you know, there's also, you know, in addition to the, the sports side, it's the diet side. Um, I know a ton of people right now who are doing keto and Whole30 and, you know, different diets that are limiting in alcohol intake. And so I'm curious, um, in your work, coaching athletes and helping people craft nutritional plans. Um, what are some of the common challenges that you see when it comes to alcohol and those, those plans, whether it's diet, whether it's sports? Um, is it a challenge at all? What is the advice and tips and tricks that you give and kind of how does, what does that look like in your world? Yeah, I, it's a huge challenge. Um, I mean, obviously, this is a very timely time for us uh, with the new year, dry January, and of course, everyone's making resolutions. Uh, to try to improve their health and fitness, improve their nutrition. Um, so it's very timely for us. Uh, we get this question a lot. Um, and in general, again, as I had stated earlier, I don't go into that conversation with someone saying, well, the first thing you have to do is stop drinking. Um, but what we have to do is look at how the alcohol affecting other things that they're doing affecting their training, affecting their recovery, affecting their nutrition choices. Um, and so I think it is important, and, and, and the question we always get, especially we talk about things like, if you're familiar, the buzzword a few years ago was paleo diet. Everyone was doing caveman paleo diet. And the buzzword now is ketogenic diet, which is exceptionally low carbohydrate, high fat diet. Uh, and kind of, I wouldn't say in the middle, but sort of the extreme version of the paleo diet is Whole30. Uh, where Whole30 uh, takes it a few steps further, eliminates all sugar, eliminates all alcohol for about 30 days. And then the question we always get when, now if you're doing Whole30, it's pretty plain and simple, like it's no alcohol. Um, when you're on paleo, the question is always, well, what can I drink? And so, <laughs> you know, people are always looking for that angle of like, what can I have? Uh, and so I think uh, something like this with mocktails is giving someone another option Although we have to be a little bit careful because of sugar content and things like that. And so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an exceptionally important topic with what I do uh, because people are always looking for how can they meet their fitness and health goals while maintaining the lifestyle that they want to maintain, whether that's socially uh, or, or whatever. So uh, it's something that we're certainly addressing and um, we certainly don't have the answer. Uh, we're constantly trying to navigate uh, the new I hesitate to use the term fad diet, but the new thing on the block, right? The new thing that's being kicked around. And right, again, right now, it's kind of a, the keto craze is going on right now. Um, so really what I want to do is talk to people about wh what's your goal? What is, why have you set this resolution? Or why are you doing dry January? Why are you going to do uh, the ketogenic diet? What is your goal? When you achieve that goal, what's that going to accomplish for you? OK, so if that's the goal that you want to achieve, how do we get there? And how does that drink choice support or hinder your ability to make it to that goal? And it's just about creating a system that allows you to make the right choice more often than you make the wrong choice. Uh, and again, I think having more options on the table where you don't feel like the outsider, because I get it. Like you go out with your friends, you're like, I'm going to be good tonight. I'm going to have the bottle of water, or I'm going to have the, the soda water, or whatever. Um, I think about my, uh, that's funny, I think, I think about my, uh, my father-in-law who, uh, who is just about to retire, so he's in his mid-60s. Um, his whole life he was never a coffee drinker, ever. Th thought it was disgusting. Um, started working with this group where every week they were meeting and having coffee. And so he felt like the outsider. And so he decided he was going to start drinking coffee. So he drank, he get, orders a mocha which he then dopes up with extra sugar and extra honey. I mean, it's just disgusting, right? But to the point was, he didn't want to feel like the outsider. He didn't want to just sit there drinking. He didn't want to order the kids' drink of a hot chocolate, so we ordered the doped up mocha, which we I haven't had that discussion with him yet, but <laughs> a little too challenging. But the whole point is, he didn't want to feel like the outsider. And the same thing with kind of what the mocktail thing, right? It's like, it's the idea of like, you want to be included and not look like the outsider and still be able to have fun and not be self-conscious about people looking at your drink. So I think, it's, I think it's interesting. I think it does add an additional challenge of how do we come up with 
recipes that are going to be supportive of not adding a bunch of additional you know, processed sugars and things like that. So uh, it's definitely a challenge that we're const always facing. So. So I think um, when we were talking about this event tonight, I think Peter probably wins the award for like most surprised to see a destination liquor store brand, restaurant bar brand on a panel talking about <laughs> zero proof drinks. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you, because you are an expert in the beverage industry, um, you follow trends really closely. Um, so I'd love to hear from you a bit um, what you're seeing in terms of trends, in terms of you know, what's selling, what people are asking for, has that changed, has it not? Um, and a little bit about, you know, are you seeing an increasing demand for more sophisticated non-alcoholic drink options? You know, why have you chosen to make that a priority as you've been opening up the new store? Cool, thanks. Um, so I would say, you know, in large part, we've seen a, a big shift in drinking in general. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, you're seeing a decline if you look at the volume of alcohol consumed throughout the United States um, has a, a fairly significant decline um, per capita. Um, however, the dollar value spent um, on alcohol in the United States has a um, more than double the opposite in increase. People are drinking less and they're drinking a lot better things. Um, and that's, that's really encouraging to me um, because, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, not only from a sales perspective, uh, but, you know, I've, it's, it's been interesting. So I, I got my first liquor license when I turned 21, um, and I, that was when we first, uh, first had the liquor license down uh, at Chocmo in our old location, and it's, it's been interesting to, to have gone through that, that time in my life um, and been been someone on the the serving end of that, and I think it's a it's a unique perspective, and and not only just being you know a server or a bartender in a restaurant, but being the person who's who's responsible legally for all actions that that come from that um, throughout you know every drink that's served, and that matters, um, and we take that that really really seriously as a brand. Um, you know, we're we're very much about responsible consumption and education that relates to alcohol and and really you know exploring our world through beverages is is our tagline for uh, for high spirits and and really you know what that means to us is that you know there's there's a lot of unique and interesting things that um, that relate to alcohol um, and I think that you know it's it's exciting to see people more and more come in and want to learn about the different things and and the industry is is evolving i think to be um you know at least we're trying to encourage it that way as much as we can to be to be more about um exploration and learning and community um than about going out and getting hammered um so from from a restaurant perspective um you know i guess my one of my biggest drivers, um, aside from you know the the big obvious ones that are you know just part of our our branding and about inclusion and community, are you know we really want to continue to promote um, responsibility um, and be the restaurant that uh, that offers those choices um, to where people can come in and they can um, you know order non-alcoholic drinks and that is a, you know an inclusive part of our menu um, not that it's it's off you know on some side tangent piece and and something entirely different so um, you know we want we want the people that um, that don't drink alcohol or aren't drinking alcohol tonight or you know maybe you already had two drinks and I'm not going to serve you another one because um, I'm not going to, um, and uh, you know we want to have some some better options to to have our staff um, be able to offer to our guests so that they're not you know feeling like they're they're being singled out and said hey you're cut off here's a sticker um, go sit in the corner um, but hey you know uh, you know I think you know we've had enough alcohol tonight we have some other great cocktails that you can enjoy uh, that don't have any alcohol and you can continue to to hang out with your friends and enjoy and and um, you know, continue to be part of the party without um, having to to go off and and go down a, a bad road. So um, that's. Did I really answer your question? You got it. <laughs> cool. We'll, we'll come back for more. Perfect. Perfect. 
Um, so Dan, you kind of represent the, the marketing and branding side of things, which I think yeah. I'm probably a bit partial on this, but um, that's a world that I love in part because I know how much it can kind of change hearts and minds and inspire people and, and really drive a lot of um, habits and trends and um, consumer habits, I guess. And so I'm curious, um, you know, from your perspective and having a lot of clients in the beer industry in particular, um, what you're seeing in the branding world on the non-alcoholic side and is it you know, would you follow the same trends and styles and approaches that you take to a beer brand as you would to a non-alcoholic beverage brand? Um, kind of share a bit of your, your marketing and branding expertise yeah, yeah. with us. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, at the end of the day, we all like well-crafted brands and beautiful packaging and well-designed things regardless of what the product is. Um, so if we have a project that's you know, not beer related or craft beverage related, we take the same design principles as we would um, if it was a beer or liquor or cider project. Um, but as far as the marketing side of it goes, you know, it really goes back to the messaging and the execution of the message. You know, with, with zero proof or non-alcoholic drinks, really how can you talk about the rebranding of non-alcoholic? Does it have to even be about the fact that it's actually substituted from the drink? C or could you flip it and focus on the positive? Um, so, you know, a lot of those little details can come out as this, this uh, zero proof trend blows up even more. So, um, but as going back to the design side, you know, Really, there's, there is some trends that are taking place in the beverage space right now. Um, there's a lot of um, things that are, are starting to be niched to millennials or, or women because now that, that those are taking place, they have a lot of buying power. And the economy has really changed because of that. So demographics are always changing, as you know. Um, and branding and design is a, is a reflection of that, too. So. I hope I answered your question. There's, there's no right or wrong answer to these questions. I really, it's really here for conversation, but it's interesting. Um, your, your comment on kind of the, the vernacular, right? Like yeah. the wording that we use, like even as we were putting this event together, it's like, <coughs> is it zero proof? Is it alcohol free? Is it mocktail? Is it soft cocktail? Is it mindful drinking? Right. I mean, I'd love to hear, you know, from your branding perspective, Marnie, from some of your experience, like from all of you, really, you know, what, what is the difference between right. these words and what does that difference mean in terms of how likely something is to sell or right. how, uh, uh, yeah, language, yeah. guys, language. Yeah, language, and if, if there's really an effective way to flip that to what's in the drink and not what's taken out of the drink, it really could become its own thing and stand on its own two legs regardless of the alcohol or not. Um, so that's something to think about is, is as this grows, what will that morph into? I, I don't, I think the NA or the non-alcoholic, you know, beer that's been around for years, that will go to the wayside and something else will come to form over time, especially as it becomes more popular. I think I'm going to kind of pass down or I can juggle it down, but what have the rest of you guys seen in terms of language that works or completely backfires? Well, you know how I feel about the word mocktail. I use it because it's what people know. Um, but if you look up the word mock in the dictionary, I think it means to make fun of something or to deceive or misrepresent. So I don't think mocktail really applies to what we're doing here. We, there's been some companies that have tried to start the trend of using the word soft cocktail, which I love, but it's a little confusing because then people think, is this like a light alcohol drink or really what is this? So. We're kind of left with alcohol-free, zero-proof, non-alcoholic um, for language. And I agree wholly with what Dan is saying because instead of talking about um, what you're taking out of it, talk about what the product is because um, I, you probably noticed one of the drinks in the lobby is called a Mimic Mule, which is basically a take on the Moscow Mule. But for the most part, what my wish is is that these alcohol-free drinks are drinks in their own right they're not trying to mimic a cocktail because you, how do you mimic the taste of alcohol or the flavor of bourbon? It's, 
it, you can't do it. So these are drinks are being created to stand on their own in their own right. So trying to find the language to convey that is, I don't think we're quite there yet. So again, mocktail is what everybody knows and it's what we use. I, I like the term zero proof because I like, I enjoy going out to nice restaurants and when I see a zero proof menu, that speaks to me, like it registers in my brain pretty quickly what it is. Um, I think the term non-alcoholic makes me think I'm ordering a drink for my kids and like I'm looking for the lemonade in the menu, um, you know, or the, the server will be like, oh yeah, our non-alcoholic options are in that terrible corner on the back of the menu. And so um, I do think that there's something about zero proof that, that connotates something that's a little bit more modern and, and you know, could stand on its own in the middle of a menu or, or you know, stand out as, as its own kind of, um, you know, beverage program in a way. And I, I think that's, that's it. I think the thing that's going to be most interesting is seeing how, you know, restaurants like Crabtree Kitchen actually drive this because I think that what the, will happen in the industry is that restaurants will be creating these kind of unique recipes and, and bringing them to consumers first and then that demand will change something wider in the beverage industry. I think it's going to be consumer driven. I think this is a really interesting conversation. It's something, it's an angle that I'd never really thought about. Uh, I was trying to come up with a, a standalone as opposed to like a stripped down version of something. Uh, and I think that's really, really important. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind when you're talking about like the Mimic Mule or trying to come up with a name that would stand on its own, it's like there are industries or groups that are always trying to mimic the thing that they actually want. And the one that popped in my head was like Tofurky. Right? It's like, it's not turkey, people. It's not turkey. So let's, try, let's stop trying to call it something that it's not, and let's create a name for it that actually stands on its own. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me, right? And so the stripped-down version of something is, is just that. It's not what it was. So let's come up with a name that allows it to stand on its own. And we find the same thing in, like in the CrossFit world. Like, people will say, like, oh, well, you, for whatever reason, you have a knee injury, you can't do CrossFit me that tells me they don't understand what we do and I can and I can say well can they do squats yeah can they ride a bike yeah I could do that it's CrossFit so it's like the na like it's, a, it's semantic a lot of times it's semantics but semantics are really really important right you've got to you got to get that right especially in the branding and marketing role like you've got to get that right and I think trying to call it something that it's not is is almost it's a disservice to, to what it is that you're trying to do so yeah I think the other part of that is that depending on what you call it, like you know, a mocktail, for instance, I think you're you're significantly limiting your customer base. Um, you know, if I see a, a drink on a menu that's called a mocktail, I'm not going to order it. Um, I'm just not going to do that. Um, it's not. Yeah, um, but I don't have kids yet, so there's that. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, actually having having drinks that. Um, that are that do stand on their own and that that are are part of the regular menu, um, I think is important. So you know, on our menu, for instance, at at Crabtree Kitchen and Bar next door here, um, we're going to to have um, them actually be on our cocktail menu um, and listed as zero proof cocktails. Um, so that's how we're delineating that, and and they are going to be kind of you know a featured section of the bar menu. Um, to me, it's, it's really a lot, um, you know, about inclusivity. Um, we really, you know, bars can be a place that's really a community gathering place, um, and that, that shouldn't change um, based on whether or not someone drinks or is drinking alcohol right now. Um, so we really want... Um, all of the different gathering places that we've designed in this building, um, especially our bar, to really be a place for conversation, um, for people to meet, and and really to be you know a cool, fun place. Um, and it's it's not about um, whether or not someone's consuming alcohol. Money. One of the things you've done that I think is really cool um, and is really part of this movement and changing hearts and minds and giving people tools. Um, can you talk a little bit about the business cards that you've developed um, and what's different about those and how that's empowering you as a consumer, but also the bars and bartenders that you're going to that um, quite possibly just don't have a good sense. They haven't spent enough time to figure out you know, what some good non-alcoholic drink options might be. 
So we created some business cards that obviously have my information on one side and on the back side is a, a drink recipe. And for instance, it would be something fairly simple like the Mimic Mule that you guys probably tasted here. Um, I find that the biggest challenge is obviously in the hospitality industry. And so I thought we just need to go right to the horse's mouth here. These are the people we need to be talking to. And what happens many times is if there's nothing listed on the menu for you to drink, then your next option is your server, right? So you're like, okay, I don't see anything on the menu. What can you offer me for alcohol-free beverage? And I'll give you the, you know, the rundown of the sodas, the iced teas, the lemonades, and then maybe you get like a virgin margarita, which by the way, don't ever order a virgin margarita. It's basically triple sec and sugar and it's not good. Anyhow, so um, trying to educate both sides of the bar really on why it's important to have alcohol-free beverages and options um, behind the bar, but also trying to empower consumers to be able to order a drink, because that's the biggest challenge for me, is if you don't have anything on the menu, I don't know what to order. I don't know how to order. Do I order a tonic and lime? Do, I, do you have berry puree in the back that you can make something for me? So I figured if we at least had some recipes on a card, they could hand them to the server and say, could you make this? And you know, maybe they can, maybe they can't, but the point is, is now we're showing demand for the product and hoping that maybe the, the bars and restaurants will start to clue in. I have one more thought on kind of the, the marketing and branding front, and then we'll switch gears just a little bit. But um, I don't know who started this, but I'm looking at Peter and Marnie. So one thing um, that I think is really cool that you've done with the, the menu here for Carpentry Kitchen and Bar, um, which I'm not sure if it's the same one that you're referring to as the Zero Proof Cocktail menu, but a, a menu that I've seen around here, it's cool because it lists out all the drinks, and there's a couple that were specifically designed out of Marnie's recipe book that are marked on there with a little logo. So it's kind of like when you go into a restaurant and you're looking for your gluten-free option and you've got the little GF right there. It's like, oh, I know, that's, that's one that is going to be a guaranteed good drink. Um, and it gives me kind of the, a quick vote of confidence as I'm looking through the menu. So I'd love to hear kind of how that came about, um, if that's something that we'll be seeing beyond Crabtree Kitchen and Bar, if other restaurants and bars might be picking that up, if that's unique to you guys. Um, how did that come about? Well, I'll, I'll just talk really quick and then Peter can fill you in because I didn't actually know that happened. <laughs> I had a friend of mine sent me a picture of the menu and I was like, oh my God, my, dream, my name's like on there. It was the best. Anyhow, um, we are working with restaurants to become uh, Marnie rated, we're calling it. So drinks are... A, basically vetted and approved. We have teams of people that are trying the drinks, vetting the drinks, making sure you know the presentation is good, taste is good, and then um, the, our logo is on the menu. So, But Peter and Carrie were the first to do that. I didn't know about the drink, but it was my recipe, so we, I knew it was good. But um, So I'll let Peter talk about how that Great. So I guess that, that started from the, the Vibe opening party that we did up here. Um, so Elena had requested that we do um, a, uh, um, a zero proof cocktail for that um, and had provided a few recipes uh, from Marnie. And, and so we, uh, we chose, um, I think, just one of them for that first one um, and did that up here for, for that event. Um, and then we decided that, um, that you know, we got a great response to that. And, and so we ended up putting that on, on uh, some of our event menus that we were doing uh, for different um, groups that we were doing throughout the building um, and uh, um, wanted to be sure to, to um, you know, note where the recipe came from and, and so of course put the, the logo on there from that. So I think um, to me as I'm listening to this, I think what we're really talking about is ways to kind of normalize diversity in beverage options no matter where we are. Um, whether it's, you know, again, helping bartenders have a recipe on hand when they don't have one handy, whether it's walking into a, a bar and being able to see quickly what options are. From the workplace perspective, um, what would you suggest that employers could do to make the workplace situations and environments more inclusive and friendly to multiple kinds of drink choices? And, you know, how could some of these um, tactics, I guess, you know, between the business cards it again. Um, can those be applied to workplaces? Is there something similar that can kind of help light that fire? Um, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I've got a couple ideas. One is I am going to stand firm on this. I don't believe in having beer kegs in the workplace. Um, I was at a co another co-working environment in Seattle and it was 
very informative to see who drank beer at 10 a.m. Um, but I also think that um, it, it detracts from, from the purpose of the environment. And um, I think that having um, a separation between what is social life and what is work life and where should your focus and attention be is super important. And if you've got you know, a, a beer keg in the middle of the kitchen, it kind of blurs those boundaries a little bit. Um, but what I do think companies should really focus on doing is incorporating other options. And so, um, you know, for example, if you're holding a, a party, um, a lot of the, the events I'll attend, um, the hosts of those parties will sell out to other technology vendors, like the opportunity to um, come up with a signature drink to have on the menu. And I'm yet to see anyone come up with a sign signature drink that doesn't include alcohol. And that would be something I would love to see from a brand to just kind of you know, throw their hat in the ring and say, look, this is something that's important to us. Um, I think the other thing that I'd love to see is wellness opportunities held up in the same arena as happy hour. Um, so I would much rather go to a yoga class at you know before the conference than stay out late you know drinking with everybody. Um, and I would love to see those sort of things promoted so that that also feels just as normal as doing business over over drinks. Dan, that's the perfect uh, segue in for you. I would love to see that too. <laughs> Um, so, if you have a conference coming up, I have a space. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, it was almost that exact question. You know, as as this market and the awareness grows, because I think it's as much the the awareness and the conversation about it as it is the market. I, in some ways, I'm like the market's always been there. It's just always been kind of taboo. Um, what do you think the future holds for the wellness industry, for athletes, for kind of the nutrition world? Um, what does it mean to have some of these options more readily available and, and a little less taboo? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I'm definitely seeing an uptick in folks who are just choosing to. And, and, and the, the folks that I know that have done it have literally just chosen to on their own, just forego alcohol in the name of better health. Um, so I, I think there is a, there's a rise in this, but I also know that there is still a very strong culture of alcohol uh, in the fitness and wellness space. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just kind of go back to this idea of I like the idea of having options so that when someone asks me what can, and we always try to steer that towards what should I drink, uh, and you can't, it's not that you can't, uh, but it's about making better choices and knowing that uh, we could recommend a place that you could go to that has options that aren't where you're not going to feel ostracized or you're not going to try to the word, you know think about like folks that are like gluten free and that type of thing one of their biggest struggles isn't just getting the food that they want but trying to convey what they want like ask it's gotten much better with gluten free like that's become almost uh, ubiquitous now where you can go out and there's there's gluten free options everywhere it wasn't that long ago when you had to like you literally had to spell it out for them what you wanted, uh, and then they still looked at you sideways. Um, and, and the same thing happens with, you know, with an alcoholic or a non-alcoholic drink. You want to have something that, again, that, that fits in, but you don't have to... It doesn't... I don't know. I guess I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a mixologist. So it just doesn't seem like it would be that hard to make a drink non-alcoholic, but apparently non-alcoholic margarita is pretty horrible, so what do I know? <laughs> but I, I just like the idea of... of giving people options and things that they can consider as an alternative. Because I think a lot of times people make choices based on the fact that they didn't know they had an alternative. They're like, it's either, it's either soda water, water, or the alcoholic drink. I guess I'll go with what I usually get. And if, if I could say, well, actually, hang on a second, there are Marnie-rated drinks right over at Crabtree or whatever. I mean, I, could, you know, I can steer them in a direction where they can make a better choice, and I, I like that. So I'm just thinking out loud because I'm a gluten-free foodie myself. And there was this app that came to play that would totally change the game for me. It's called Find Me Gluten-Free. And so I travel a lot, and so I could pull that app, and it was basically like Yelp, but for gluten-free. Love to see something like that in your space, you know? 
and and you know that that would be that would be phenomenal because again it's it's you know that's a discrete thing where I don't have to bother everybody in my party and say well I need a gluten free menu but I can look up a in whatever city I am in the world and see who has one and then just make the suggestion that that's where we go so if I was somebody who was choosing to forego drinking for the night or you know entirely to have that as kind of a discrete way to see what my options are prior to us showing up there that would be pretty cool. Marnie, are you working on that? Well, I am now. <laughs> and just to further that comment a little bit, actually, I just totally lost my train of thought. Yelp, uh, directory. Gluten-free. It's almost there. It's almost there. It was. Uh, I don't know. You can okay, we'll come back. I, Peter, one of the things that I hear often um, in the beverage world, I think, is this argument of like, well, it's not really worth me putting non-alcoholic options on the menu because they're only, I can only charge people three and five dollars. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what you feel the zero proof world represents in terms of revenue? Is that really true that the non-drinkers just don't bring in the money? I think that's currently the norm. Um, I think that's, that's one of the things that um, that we're going to be seeking to change is actually doing, you know, non-alcoholic cocktails that are actually worth paying for, because um, I think those people would pay for them if they were something that was worth paying for. Um, so I, I think we can we can liken it a lot to the the decaf coffee world. Um, if you look at um, I like numbers and statistics and spreadsheets and those sorts of things. So I get kind of excited when a vendor can bring me, you know, cool numbers to look at. And, and so I was looking, you know, when we, uh, when we switched coffee vendors to Cafe Umbria, which is what we serve uh, at Chocmo, um, we, we talked a lot about, you know, what, which blends are we going to use and the whole bit. And one of the things that I found really interesting at that time is that they they sort a lot harder and they buy even higher quality beans for their decaf coffee. Um, and the reason being is that a decaf coffee drinker um, is literally the most loyal coffee drinker in the entire segment. They will get the same decaf coffee every day at the same place exactly the way they want it once they find the place that does it just that right way. Um, so looking at that, you know, from that perspective, here I've got a coffee company that literally pretty much sells energy, right? Um, they're, they're selling us that energy that we're putting in our cup and, and doing that, and, and they're telling me that, great, you know, well, we put even extra care into our decaf beans, and that's why, you know, you're going to pay an extra premium over, over what you're even paying for the regular beans for the stuff that doesn't have any caffeine in it, um, or very little caffeine, really, if we're being honest. But... Um, so I, I think the you know the non-alcoholic um, cocktail world um, has that same kind of possibility, um, and I think you know an interesting um, segment of that that's growing is really the you know the kombucha and the shrubs and some of those things that that are showing that you know there really is a market for some of those things there, and that people are are willing to uh, to pay for things that are actually worth buying. Um, so I think that's, that's really the, the key takeaway there. And, and you know, our, our big thing for Crabtree Kitchen and Bar is really changing, excuse me, changing people's interactions with food and drink. Um, so we're really, we're really seeking to change how people are interacting with the food that they're eating and the drinks that they're enjoying. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot of things um, to really shake things up and, and uh, you know, provide a lot of, education and exploration about, you know, what do those things mean and why and and not just, you know, continue to, to serve the same stuff. Hold on to your mic for just a second because I've got one more question for Dan, but I'm going to pass this to Marnie for a dovetail comment. Just quickly, when I first started this project, I um, needed to educate myself because I never worked in the hospitality industry at all. So I interviewed some bartenders. And one of the first bartenders I interviewed was, um, he's actually become a, one of my best bartender friends. Uh, but he's big, tall, like grizzly guy. I went into the bar and he was like, eh, people come into a bar to drink. Why, you know, why do you need al anti, you know, al alcohol free? And 
I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to say to this guy, but he, his big thing was money. I, how am I going to make a drink? It's a dollar for a lime right now. How am I going to make a drink that actually people want to buy and charge enough money? People aren't going to pay for it. And I said, well, here's the thing. If you just have one drink on your menu that I can purchase, maybe it's $5, maybe it's $6. I don't, I don't want a $2 drink. Charge me six bucks for the drink. I'll pay for it. And if it's good, you know I'm coming back. And you know I'm going to tell all my friends about you. And you know when I come back, I'm bringing all my drinking friends. And you know when I have my birthday party, I know the place to come where they make good alcohol-free, alcohol-free cocktails. So maybe they don't make a... F- on the one drink he just made me, but there's the bigger picture. Okay, Dan, last question, then we're going to turn it over to the audience for any questions that you guys have. Oh my gosh, these mics. Okay. Um, Dan, um, as it relates to the beverage industry in particular, um, how have you seen kind of design change in the last five years, and what are your predictions kind of here five years out down the road, um, what you expect to see happening? Good, good question. Um, Specifically in beer, you know, big design trend over the last five years has been reclaimed wood. We all know that. We've all seen it. Reclaimed wood, this, reclaimed wood, that. Um, Also, um, you know, one thing that we have all seen become more popular is better health choices in beverage, even in beer. Um, You know, in the early 70s, early 80s, or yeah, around that time frame, um, there was a big push for light beer uh, because before that, Um, you know, light beer hadn't even been created yet. So there was a big, you know, two decade push for light beer and really, really that was for health reasons. Um, And then, you know, coming back to craft in the 90s and then the big boom in 2008. So as far as design goes, um, you know, looking to the future, what I would see happening is definitely more health conscious um, beverages on the market and designed to reflect that. Um, and you know, as the beer industry grows, I see those consumers also looking for additional options as the market gets even more saturated. So, um, and then also as, as the vessels are concerned, um, consumers are looking to look at better options for plastic. So we'll probably see some bioplastics starting to come into play. Um, And then also uh, a big trend that we're already starting to see, and we just finished our first project on it at our office last week, is CBD-infused beverages. So um, that, with the Farm Bill passing last month, that will definitely take an uptick too. Um, And a lot of these companies that are, are looking at those different options are really realizing that there is some saturation in Uh, some of those craft beverage spaces, um, spirits, beer, and cider. So what's next after those, those three things? Sorry, raise your hand again. I saw a hand in the corner. Um, I just, I really, I really have a comment and it's for Peter and for the restaurant industry, I think. Um, there's a wonderful restaurant in San Diego called, um, Cucina Urbana, and what they're known for is their phenomenal cocktails. They could charge a mint for these little teeny tiny cocktails. They make their own muddles, they make their own infusions. It's them, they, they design new cocktails all the time and then they have regular ones that they have on a regular basis. But I don't think that it's, it's that far to ask a really good mixologist or your, the best bartender you have to come up with some of those wonderful zero proof cocktails and I'm sure you're thinking about it and doing your own and research but I think you could charge as much as you could for a regular cocktail if you have the right taste involved and I would be willing to buy it. I have a couple of kids who are 20 something and you know you turn 21 and the the shackles are off and there's a rebelliousness and you drink until you drop for years. And I think that's a lot of you know, where our alcoholism is nurtured. Um, what answer is there in zero proof for your Greek row, um, for the bars that the 21, 22 year olds are going to? The non-alcoholic beer didn't 
didn't work, didn't make it. I don't know if I have an answer for you, but I can tell you that um, one of the things that caught me off guard when I started all of this was the amount of messages I received from uh, young ladies in their 20s. Um, I choose not to drink because alcoholism runs in my family. I've never liked it. Um, I had a drinking problem. I've been sober now. That surprised me. Um, when we announced National Mocktail Week, we issued a nationwide press release and my PR agent sent me a link that Texas A&M University actually in honor, on honor of National Mocktail Week held a mocktail party. So I don't know that I have the answer about that, but I do know that we lead by example. And um, so if we just keep putting the message out there, I think it's, it's starting to take root. So I think dovetailing off of that, I think it's about changing culture. Um, so, you know, right now I think we have um, a strong culture around overindulgence um, and I think that's, that's really the key uh, to change that. Um, so, I mean, from a, uh, from a restaurant perspective, uh, it's one of the reasons that we don't do things like, um, you know, ask people when they order a bourbon, do you want a single or a double? We don't do that. Um, we serve the drinks the way that we serve them, and we don't encourage someone to do to to order more alcohol than they were planning to order already, um, right? I mean, it's it's those little things that make a huge difference. Um, you know, I I don't like the way that restaurants often have you know three different sizes available for their uh, glass pour of wine. Do you want a three, a six, or a nine ounce pour? Who the hell heck needs a, a nine ounce glass of wine? Um, that's ridiculous. Um, so there's there's no place for that in a quality restaurant. Um, I don't believe that that that's the message that we want to send to to our guests, to our kids, um, and that's not um, you know that's not what we want. So the way that we that we change that and we we start to to fix the the societal norm of overindulgence is by, by changing the little things and making, um, making the non-alcoholic drinks an inclusive part of our culture um, and a, a normal thing. I, I think in addition to changing culture, it's about education. So um, we educate kids on all sorts of things and then we send them off to college and just kind of like let them go wild. And um, I was one of those. And I, I got in trouble, I got in big trouble, and I got my, um, my enrollment pulled before school even started, which is what University of Washington will do to you if you're a drunk freshman at early fall admission. And, um, and they put you in what's called an alcohol skills training course. And it is a class that takes place in a laboratory at the University of Washington where they do alcohol studies. And they do all sorts of studies there. Um, particularly hilarious ones are when they give people fake alcohol and they tell them they're getting drunk and they typically sit by themselves and they're like really, you know, antisocial. And then they give people fake alcohol and say they're giving them booze. And then they watch them get really like raucous and they're not drunk at all. Um, and so they tell you those stories, but they also tell you the science behind alcohol and how it works and how it works in your body and what it does to you. And if you're a hundred pound you know, small 18-year-old girl, how that's different than the football player who's at the party. And so when you graduate from alcohol skills training course, they actually give you this little card, and I had it for a really long time in my wallet, and it shows your body weight, and it shows how many hours has passed and how many drinks you've had. And the second I understood that as a young person going into a party situation, it completely changed my perspective, especially when it comes to being female and being safe and knowing what my limit was, that I still have that number in my head to this day that like, yeah, I can't legally drive after one drink because I'm so small. But I didn't know that without that education. And so we teach kids about so many other things, but we don't really teach them about how to approach alcohol in a safe way. I run a local chamber of commerce and I'm really interested in this. Um, I happen to be uh, a recovering alcoholic and uh, uh, sober five years. and. Uh, and yet I'm a business, very successful businesswoman. Uh, and so that intersection of, of alcohol and business, 
uh, is something that now that I'm running a Chamber of Commerce, I'm particularly interested in. Uh, and I've really been talking a lot about this because I've known Marnie for a little while, uh, and I've been talking about this movement. Um, and I, I'm really encouraged. Uh, people like uh, the head of Green Drinks in Bremerton is talking about offering a mocktail, you know, as, as part of the plethora of booze that is, you know, offered at these business networking events, which, uh, to be honest with you, they're just drinking events. Um, I, I see very little business networking that goes on. The only other comment that I'd have, though, so I want to talk to you, possibly about bringing you down to Bremerton and, and talking about this, um, but the only other comment is, um, you know, there's the drinking, but then there's the behavior. And you talked about, you know, I wrote that down, the deterioration uh, that happens over an evening. Um, and so uh, it's something to keep in mind is that for those of us who don't drink, whether it's, it's for whatever reason, um, it's a lifestyle uh, uh, choice as well as a life and death choice. Uh, and I don't enjoy going to a restaurant where a lot of people are drinking too much. It's, it's not enjoyable. That's not why I go out to enjoy a good meal. You know, so um, I hope that this can, can influence um, that culture that you were talking about that, that's really kind of taken over uh, our society. So thank you from the business perspective. Um, I'll talk more with you later. Any other questions, comments? I just have a comment. I have four children ranging from 13 to 21, and uh, my middle daughter, she has a, she's off at college, and her college boyfriend is 23, and he chooses not to drink. And uh, he's fantastic. And when he, he has told a story, he recently went to a bachelor party. One of his friends got married, and he doesn't drink. And he's, he's like, oh, I'm fine with that. And so when everybody's doing shots, he's doing shots of soda water because he's like, I still want to be part of it. You know, I still want to be, he doesn't want to be that like, oh, I'm 23, I don't drink. Oh, are we inviting him? You know, he says, I still want to be part of it. And so that's what, that's what he does. And I think with the whole mocktail, I agree with you, Marnie. Mocktail reminds me of Red Robin and like a virgin strawberry daiquiri, right? Um, I like the zero proof because it, it feels grown up, right? It feels grown up. Um, and so when Austin comes over and I think, ooh, okay, what beverage am I going to make for him? But then he does say like, oh, my very favorite thing is seltzer water. Like, you know, <laughs> you know. but and I do have a question. Um, have you heard of Seedlip? It's, do you guys have that? Uh, Marnie actually brought me a bottle. Uh, so it is, I don't believe, currently available for real in the United States yet. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, so it, for people who don't know, so Seedlip, it is made from a people who make it's gin, a non-alcoholic right? distilled, distilled spirit. right it's a non-alcoholic yeah. distilled spirit and i thought ooh, i really want to try that and but i'm like oh it's like 40 dollars a bottle and i'm not sure i want to commit to 40 dollars a bottle if it tastes like soda water um <laughs> you know also because it's coming from the uk it is hard to get there's another one called alt gin that i think I'm think comes from Australia, but I think maybe Peter can talk to uh, this a little bit, but they're discovering these new processes for distilling like vegetables and things. And so that's what a lot of this stuff is. So if you were like a gin drinker, I never liked gin, but gin definitely has its own unique flavor. These types of products um, are kind of a good match for that. Peter, this is a niche for you in your next crab tree uh, distilling. <laughs> All right, going once, going twice. Any last questions, comments? Yeah, okay. We have. Do you have plans in the future to sell the makings of these zero-proof drinks in your in high spirits? That's what I'd like. Yes. To see. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, so we are currently um, actively working on trying to get in some of the non-alcoholic distilled spirits so we can have those available. Um, and then, yes, cocktail kits are in our future, as are um, as we grow our bar program upstairs. Our, our goal is to have, you know, many of the drinks that you can come enjoy up at our bar up at Crabtree Kitchen um, that you can go down to High Spirits and buy the complete kit to take home. And there's no reason that a non-alcoholic drink should be any different from that. So that's definitely on the, on the goal list. Um, one of the only people that mentioned sugar was the wellness guy. And when we came tonight, I was like, I'm so excited about this. I was like, but Matt, the sugar, I was like, it's going to be there. It's going to be prevalent because that's what these drinks are predominantly. Is it's like a fruit base, you know, it's, but the, when you have a non-alcoholic beverage and you're using, what is the sugar, right? Is it a really nice organic fruit juice that my body can digest? Is it a simple syrup that my body's like, eh, where are we going to put that? So my question is, is in the world of whatever we're, you know, in zero proof, do you think there'll be savory or low sugar or natural sugar approaches to one of the reasons why we don't drink alcohol? Because that's my biggest reason is I'm like, this isn't good for me in like lots of ways. Yeah, that's one of our primary goals in really developing what that drink list looks like um, because, you know, uh, actually having things that are good for you is kind of at the core of what Crabtree Kitchen and Bar is, is here for. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I, was, I was jokingly going to tell you that, you know, the best thing to do really is just to go down and get the, the cheapest uh, sour mix you can and just use that in everything because um, it's, you know, ult ultra processed fruit juice. Um, and high fructose corn syrup. So, uh, you know, the more of that that you consume, really, the better. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it helps. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but that's, that's really at the core of, of what, you know, we want to see. And that's, that's why when, when I was first talking with Marnie about, you know, what do those cocktails want to look like, um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, sugar as part of that. And, and, you know, she'd mentioned that, uh, you know, it was, it was frustrating to only see the, the sweet, syrupy, sugary drinks on the menu. And, and that's, that's part of what was really, you know, unappealing um, about, you know, um, non-alcoholic drinks is that that's, that's typically what they are. So I think that um, we're going to uh, work on changing that. So when you're building a cocktail, you have the alcohol as your base, so you're building your drink around that as, as your foundation, right? That's your flavor that you're really working with. And so when you're making a zero-proof drink, you really have to be creative with your flavors, and it's hard to do because um, simple syrups are a really super easy way to get some really subtle flavors, and you can make jalapeno simple syrup, lavender, or anything you can think of you can make in a simple syrup, juniper. Um, so many times that's what a lot of the uh, ingredients will be in an alcohol-free cocktail and juice. So it's right now, I don't know how, I, I'm not a mixologist, I don't know how to get around that, but I do see it is the question I get asked a lot. So there's got to be some kind of trend here where people are going to start coming up with things that are sugar, either low sugar or no sugar. I hesitate to say sugar-free because that always makes me think chemical, right? Yeah. Yeah, just going back, I just think that's the ultimate challenge, and um, I was thinking about this as, a, as I was preparing to come here this evening, and I, whenever we try to substitute something, we always screw it up, right? I mean, think about the fat-free 80s and 90s, like, and what we realize is, like, hopefully that, that just is going to be gone, gone soon, but what we realize is that, A, it wasn't any better for you, and the only way they can make it even somewhat appetizing was to load it up with sugar or you know, what other chemical things they put in there. Uh, and so that's my only concern with this, with this movement is that, that we can come up with alternatives that, despite the fact that they're alcohol-free, alcohol they're not necessarily any better for you, right? Because that's just, it, it defeats the purpose. Right, it defeats the purpose it, to some degree. Okay, I want to thank all of you and for, for hosting us tonight, and I'm so excited. I'm going to go home and start trying to make all sorts of different mocktails, but essential oils are some great quality essential oils that you could use 
in with lavender and lemon and orange and um, and that's ingestible and, and healthy and I think is could be the way of the future of having a very healthy um, appealing cocktail um, it's very inspiring for me I lived in Germany for 25 years where tap water is basically more expensive than beer and wine and the culture <laughs> completely revolved around alcohol and which I really enjoyed but it's so nice to see this movement here and to see all of you be a great part of it and um, thank you okay um, going back and I think that's an important point and going back to this idea of like everything having to be sweet I think we're seeing that shift already if you look at what's happening with like LaCroix sparkling water and all these sparkling waters are coming up like when I was when I was in college my wife I'm from Wisconsin where LaCroix is from I didn't get it like my wife would drink these things she's like it's raspberry and like it doesn't taste like raspberry it smells like raspberry <laughs> I've developed a I've developed a liking for for LaCroix but it has absolutely exploded and it's not has it doesn't hasn't had hasn't they didn't take the sugar out there was just never sugar there uh, and so I think there is a market for drinks that aren't loaded with sugar, still have great flavor or essence. Maybe it's in some sort of oil or something like that. But there's definitely a market that's out there, and, and I, I believe it's going to grow. So I even debated about asking this because uh, I guess more it's just a frustration. But as an adult child of an alcoholic, and my husband's a recovering alcoholic, we always just do the water. So as I work on different fundraising groups, and we have the um, the auctions and everything, and I kind of complain about how much alcohol is always served, their big thinking is, well, when everybody's drunk, they spend a lot more money. And um, I just don't know what, I, maybe there's nothing that can be resolved with that. I think when people have fun, they spend money too. So we have to find ways to supplant that, that feeling of euphoria that people have. So when people are euphoric and having a great time, they spend money. Sometimes alcohol is a way to get them there, but we have to just have to find alternative ways to get them to that state. Oh, you're going to pull me for one more? Yeah, more. Okay, one last question, then we're going to wrap. It's a quick question. It's, uh, it's mainly a question for recipes. My name is Josh Fisher. I live here in Polzo, and I've been working with the city to build a skateboard park. And the city is going to do it. We're moving forward with it. We're going to do fundraising. And one of the things that I was interested in this evening was because we need to do a lot of fundraisers and events and this is a skate park and it's for our children the future of this community and so me being an adult I'm totally fine with it at a brewery or having drinks around but if this is for the kids we want to have fun events to raise awareness and show support to the city and to NGOs and to donors I think this is a really exciting opportunity to look into and to have you know some fun zero proof cocktails that kids can drink and have it be a part of the event so if you have any recipes for kids, and I'll look at the, web, the your w website, but. Your old son actually was in the shoot with me, helping me make the drink, and it made me actually uncomfortable at first, because I thought this could go sideways, depending on who's, you know, who's watching. Um, but the point that she made was, this is something that is good for your family. This is something that your kids can be around. This is something that your kids can drink, so. Definitely understand, and anything on the website you're welcome to have, or you know, I'm sure Peter's got some great recipes too. So, thank you for all of the great questions. I feel like half the time you put the you open up the floor for questions and it goes silent, and it was really fun to to have it be so interactive here tonight. So, um, we are going to wrap up. I want to do kind of one more run down the panel. Um, if there's anything that you haven't said yet that you would like to share, a call to action, how can we kind of keep this momentum going um, that really does feel like it's at a bit of a turning point in terms of the conversation and the dialogue? Um, what can we do to keep that going? Um, and or kind of what do you see happening from here on out? Um, so I'm just going to do a plug really quick for my event next Thursday. It's in Seattle. Um, again, the funds from the event are going to Recovery Cafe in Seattle. We have uh, live music. Um, dancing, we have food, it's going to be a really great evening if you all can make it. You can find the link to that on my website at marnieray.com. But I think the point that I just really want to make is that this is not, like I said earlier, this really isn't about the drink recipes or the drink, this is really about building community and being inclusive. Um, you know, we talk a lot about breaking bread, 
over the table, uh, around the table with our family and friends, and you know we go out for drinks with our girlfriends, and we tell stories and we reminisce, and this is all part of it. You know, we try and make sure people have good food to eat, and so let's make sure people have options so they can make good choices too. My um, parting words are, are going to go back to the my yogi side, which is about consciousness. And I think that the big thing that we're seeing just culturally in general is people being way more conscious of their choices and their behaviors. And um, I think that it starts with thinking about ourselves and why are we choosing a drink or why are we not going to in certain in instances and being you know, in that higher state. Um, but I think the next step is to be more conscious of others. It's really easy to walk into a space and you know, think about your choices, but what about the people around you, and how can we make sure that you know, regardless of the choice that somebody wants to make that, easy, that evening, that they're being safe and, and that they're being supported by you know, having a good space and a good community around them. Um, I guess I would just go back to something I've said a couple times already, is that I would encourage people to uh, consider their choices, um, consider alternatives, but really think about what your goals are, and take a hard look at is the alternative choice you're making actually a, a good choice uh, or is it just kind of a, a sheep you know wolf in sheep's clothing so think about what you're definitely um, consider your goals consider what you're trying to achieve um, and then make your choices from there so in my mind I think you know how we uh, do some things to keep this momentum going um, you know, as as we work on continuing to to get ready to actually open up next door, one of the uh, the event ideas that's on our list is doing a uh, a non-alcoholic cocktail party um, that we would invite people out to, and we'd have some appetizers and we'd have a sampling of a number of the different non-alcoholic cocktails that we've been playing with um, available for people to taste and um, you know provide feedback on and that kind of thing. So I think you know events like that. Um, and like Marnie's event in Seattle and some of those things and just continuing to, to you know, provide that, that joy and euphoria um, without um, necessarily that including alcohol, um, I think will help, um, you know, make that part of a, of a societal norm. So I think that's exciting. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on last is, you know, we kind of talked about the restaurant industry and hospitality and stuff like that. I really think there's a lot of opportunity here actually in the brewery world. Um, breweries have very, very limited options as far as non-alcoholic. Root beer or water is basically what you get. Um, I could see a lot of the breweries in more of the, you know, Seattle, Portland areas, areas getting behind this as they want to open their doors to more people, especially as the market is getting more and more saturated. Um, that would allow them to bring in customers that enjoy a brewery environment, but don't necessarily want to drink. Um, you know, they want to go for the, the cornhole tournaments or the, uh, the yoga and beer nights, but they don't want to drink the beer. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there additional options. I kind of have felt it all along, but really these last, this last like line of comments, I think probably the word community was mentioned by every single person going down the line, which um, is no surprise to me, um, but it's also really exciting because of course that's what we're all about here at Vibe. Um, but I think it's also just this reflection of how much food and drink are a part of what brings us together. And so the more we can make it normal to have different options and choices for everyone, depending on your mood for the day and what you're doing the next day and what your lifestyle choices are, I think that's better for all of us. So thank you for coming here tonight to um, share the conversation with us. I think there's, are the drinks still out? Do you know, drinks are still out? A huge thanks to Crabtree Kitchen and Bar, Peter and Carrie who are here tonight for providing the drinks for us um, and giving us some different samplings of different options of things that are not necessarily overly sugary and sweet and look beautiful and feel grown up in glasses. Um, so thank you for that. Um, if you're at all inclined, please do drop a couple bucks in the, the Water Aid um, glass at the door. I'm happy to share more about that story as well for anyone who's interested. Um, and thanks again for coming.